Hey everyone, welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your questions. I'm Ashley Mova, and if you've got a question that you want answered on air, you can send it over anytime to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. You can get it answered on Mailbag or Movie Talk and sit in with me to answer those questions. Right now is the editor in chief of AMC Movie News, John Campion. John, I have you? just had an epiphany about what will be our top rated show on AMC Movie News. It's going to be things Ashley Mova says off camera. I, I believe if you guys could see and hear and be a fly on the wall and all the things go on in here before cameras start You'd rolling, you completely view me. Differently. You would totally see her differently. It would be our number one show. It, I think we got. A, I think we've got our AMC Movie News first reality show. As a matter of fact, oh, I, I love. That. I think we're going to have Dennis and Jonathan follow just Amy, uh, Amy Rose, uh, Ashley around all the time with cameras and just capture all oh the, the golden nuggets that come out. I'm sweating just hearing about it. Okay, <laughs> Jake Berlin. And writes, my question is about Brendan Fraser. I just recently watched Crash again. I forgot that Brendan Fraser was in it. The last time I remember seeing him on the big screen was the last Bad Mummy movie, and before <laughs> that was that little cameo in the first G.I. Joe. I always thought he was a solid actor, not bad enough to kind of just disappear at least. Thoughts? I actually think Brendan Fraser is a great actor. I, first of all, one of my most unsung underappreciated comedies mm -hmm. of all time. Whenever you get these discussions about most unsung underappreciated comedies of all time, one one of the ones that is always going to be on my list is this great little film he did called Bedazzled. Uh, Bedazzled. What? Uh, fact checker Dennis. Can who? What was? I keep forgetting the name of the female lead. Uh, she was a supermodel. Um, Elizabeth Hurley. Elizabeth Hurley. Thank you so much. So Elizabeth Hurley stars in it uh, with him as the devil. Mm -hmm. And it is oh, I just remember it now. so great. It is a, it's not a good comedy. It is a great comedy that whenever I throw, and I, I admit I haven't probably watched it in about two and a half, maybe three years. But when, it doesn't matter how many times I see it. When I watch it, I just laugh my ass off. It is so great. When you talk about films that he did, like the one he did with Joe Pesci uh, with Honors, that one really showed off um, some great acting chops. But then he could be a big charismatic guy on screen too with movies like Encino Man or George of the Jungle. Mm -hmm. I thought George of the Jungle was great, um, which is the movie I totally fell in love with Leslie Mann uh, <laughs> that when she was a much younger Leslie Mann at the time. Um, so he's got a lot of... Of credits to his his resume that are really strong and really good, but at some point, whether it was because of the second Mummy movie or the third or whatever else, or maybe it's because he started doing little cameos in GI Joe or doing that one whatever that adventure to the center of the earth one he did was I I don't know, but at some point he just kind of fell out of favor. I don't know why. I actually think the dude is a really talented dude. I think he's shown he can be a really talented dude. I think he's got great comedic talent, great comedic timing. Um, but you're right. He has kind of slipped off the radar. And I think that's a really unfortunate thing. Because I think when he's on his game and in the right kind of role, I think he's really dynamite. Do you think he lives off of uh, royalties? Food stamps? Like, <laughs> food stamps, royalties. Is there a certain time frame where actors will get paid for their work without... Um, you know, doing another one of those movies. Yeah, I think that, yeah, royalties um, and uh, payments like that, those are all worked into the standard SAG, Screen Actors yeah. Guild contract. So yeah, so every time you go out and rent Bedazzled, he's he's still getting a little paycheck out of that. So he's he's doing okay. Don't don't worry about Brendan Fraser. I actually Fraser. recently saw him on TMZ complaining that his wife is asking for too much um, alimony. His ex-wife is asking ex for too, too much alimony and he can't afford it. So maybe we should go rent Bedazzled. Well, but yeah, well, depending on the separation agreement, maybe he does need a little bit of help so maybe he is on food stamps i don't know i like the guy <laughs> david perez writes greetings amc crew i hope you're all having a wonderful day my question is how do directors cast themselves in their own movies do they go through the same process an actor would go through or do they simply just cast themselves because it's their movie examples of what i mean are ben affleck and argo and john favreau and chef <laughs> well i mean do they have to go the same process that other actors do no it would be likened unto this let's say we're starting a few new amc uh, shows here on uh, going into phase three and let's say I decided I wanted to be on one of those shows what process do yeah. I need to go through hey John do you want to be in this new show yes John I would <laughs> fantastic done you know and and that is I think 95% of the time when you see uh, a director acting in his own movie that's the process 
you know, John Favreau. Hey, John, you want to star in Chef? Yes, John, I do. Fantastic. And then he's doing that. It's like, I want a really hot love interest. Well, let's get two. Let's get the girl. Let's get the woman from Modern Family. And let's get Scarlett Johansson as the two women in your life. How's that? <laughs> yes, John, I like that girl. Um, so, yeah, th- that's really what happens. They just think this is a good vehicle for them. And they're going to do it. Ben Affleck has done it a couple of times. To great effect, uh, the town was fantastic, wonderfully d- directed and wonderfully acted by him. Argo, he acted and he starred in and directed. Did it hurt his film? Yeah, won that little trophy called the Best Picture Award at the Oscars, so obviously that did pretty well. But also let's look through history. Uh, Clint Eastwood has done it a number of times with great success. Um, you're talking about films like Unforgiven. That I think, Dennis, help me if I'm wrong. I believe Unforgiven won Best Picture at the Academy Awards, if I'm not mistaken. If you want to look that up. And Million Dollar Baby, which I don't know if Million Dollar Baby won Best Picture, but I know it was nominated for Best Picture. And I think Clint Eastwood... I think both won. I think they both won. And I know Clint Eastwood was at least nominated for Best Actor in both. And if I'm not mistaken, he was also nominated for Best Director in both. So, I mean, so it can work. George Clooney has done with Good Night and Good Luck. And that worked out. Roberto Benigni, one of my all-time favorite films is Life is Beautiful. You know, Roberto Benigni starred in and directed that. So we see a lot of uh, examples where directors can star in their own films and have great success. Now, we have also seen directors star in their own films and not have it work out so well. A uh, Million Ways to Die in the West just happened, right? That didn't work out so well. I just mentioned Roberto Benigni in Life is Beautiful. Well, how about Roberto Benigni in Pinocchio? That did not work out so well. Um, uh, Eddie Murphy in Harlem Nights did not work out so well. Uh, uh, Tom Green in Freddy Got Fingered did not work out so well. Hey, that was great. (laughs) Well, you know, I'm sure there's something in it for everybody. But the point is that it can work. It cannot work. There's nothing that says that it's always going to work. Nothing that says it always doesn't work. We've got great examples of when it didn't work. We've got great examples of when it does. So, uh, and as far as the process they need to go through, no, they just have to look in the mirror and decide for themselves, mm-hmm. do I think this will work? And if so, they can put themselves in it. How do you feel about when even actors do this, when they put their kid in the movie? Oh, it's, yeah. yeah. I, I call this the Will Smith syndrome. And it's literally what it, I was thinking. It literally is the Will Smith <laughs> syndrome. And, you know, Will Smith has never even been the director right. of a film doing it, but he's clearly been the guy in power mm-hmm. you know, as, you know, a guy producing it and whatever. And sometimes, you know, he's had films where he said, I won't do it unless I get to have my kid in it really? and stuff like that. Yeah. I, look, I am all for, uh, and this is almost an entirely separate subject, but I am all for an actor or a director or anybody in the business doing what they can do to open doors for their kids. That's just being a good parent. Right. I got enough. Well, some parents might say, nope, you got to completely do it on your own. I think that's great. And I, I see, I know some parents would go, we're going to do our best to try to open doors for you and give you opportunities. That's great too. The Will Smith thing though is a, a little bit different for me um, because it hasn't just been Will Smith trying to open doors for us. It's, it's been Will Smith holding productions hostage, saying, I'm not even going to be in your movie. I'm going to pull the plug on this whole damn thing unless you give my kid a role in the film. And that's, that's bull. I, I don't like that move at all. And the other thing is, what's really funny is that I believe Jaden Smith, while he's been a subpar kid actor sometimes, I believe Jaden Smith has also shown he's got talent. Mm-hmm. Like, I thought he was really good. Some people bang on the remake of The Karate Kid. I actually thought the remake of The Karate Kid was real good. I enjoyed it a lot, as a matter of fact. I was really surprised by it. And I thought Jaden Smith was actually quite good in it. I think Jaden Smith can build his own career, maybe slower, without daddy trying to force him on people. As a matter of fact, I almost feel like the audience has gotten to the point now that Will Smith is hurting Jaden Smith's development in his career a little bit because now I think if if he hadn't been doing all that kind of stuff I think people go Jaden Smith's in it cool but now when they see Jaden Smith's in it they instantly go to oh is Will Smith forcing him on us again and so this could be one of those rare instances where the the dad trying to help his kid is actually hurting his development and I like to see what Jaden Smith can do on his own because like I said he got me on board with him with Karate Kid got me on board so let's see what he can do on his own 
Just calm thought. down, Will Smith. Calm down, Will Smith. <laughs> Dylan Scottsdale writes, Hey guys, love the show. Do you guys think it's possible we might get a Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice teaser during the Super Bowl? Love to hear your thoughts and keep up with the great work. Nope. Nope, I don't think we're going to. And I believe there are reports going around, and, and there is some substance to this as to why it, it, it is a little bit believable. There's a report going around uh, that... I believe their Warner Brothers wants to play the first teaser with Jupiter Ascending. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I believe that's January 6th, which is just five days after the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And I just believe, as of right now, I think only one movie is playing a trailer during the Super Bowl. And I think that's Jurassic World. Jurassic World's been confirmed. They're, they're doing it. But I think if there was any other ones, especially a movie with the profile of Batman versus Superman... I think if that were going to get play at Super Bowl, I think we would have heard about it by now. So the fact that they're going to be putting it with Jupiter sending another Warner Brothers picture just five days later, the fact that this year NBC or whoever is running, I think it's NBC, it has the rights to the Super Bowl, is charging $4.5 million for a 30-second commercial. That means, and I don't think Batman versus Superman, I don't think Warner Brothers wants their first public revelation of Batman versus Superman to be a 30 second spot. I don't think that's what they want everybody's first impression to be, it's just a 30 second spot. Which means they probably have to buy at least a minute, which means they would have to spend nine oh million gosh. dollars just to play a one minute you know, teaser trailer. All signs point to no. Look, will I keel over of shock if I'm watching the Super Bowl mm-hmm. and a Batman versus Superman trailer comes up? Nope, be- because you know there's good arguments to be made about why you should do it. But I really am not expecting it. I think we're going to have to wait until January 6th. I, and, we, and maybe after that. Like, just because there are reports out there saying that it's going to be playing yeah. with Jupiter 70 on February 6th, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Yeah. But I expect that's when we will see the first one. Do you think we'll see any other trailers? I mean, that money factor is just crazy. That is nuts. And we talked about this before because at that dollar value, even at just a 30-second spot, $4.5 million, you're talking about, for most films, 20% of their marketing budget. on one 30-second commercial that airs one time. It's the biggest stage of them all. It's the Super Bowl. It just doesn't seem... You've got to be really strategic about it. I think Jurassic World is a good one to do. I think Mm -hmm. they need the push, and I think this is a good one for them. And because of the type of movie that it is, I think a lot of sports fans are going to be into seeing a giant dinosaur movie. So it's good, targeted marketing. At this price level, though, it becomes much more of a finer, mm-hmm. um, narrower field of potential candidates for that because they just price themselves out. Field, no pun intended. Aha! <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Simon Gard Hansen writes, I always hear people complaining about Johnny Depp for bad performances. Sure, he hasn't exactly been on a roll lately, but he has had films like Public Enemies, Rango, and Tusk. It seems like people have forgotten how good he actually is. Why don't other actors receive as much criticism? Has it become a cool thing to complain about Johnny? What is up with this? Thanks, and John, bring on that filthy. He wasn't that good in Public Enemies. In Rango, he was just the voice actor, so he went in for a couple of days and did voice work, so there's really nothing to that that and then on and then tusk wasn't that huge it's not like he was the leading guy in tusk the pr- problem is see here's the thing you go back the lone ranger dreadful just dreadful <laughs> um transcendence dreadful dark shadows dreadful the rum diaries dreadful public enemies i believe dreadful and a people are just a, a lot of people are just getting kind of tired despite the what the box office says a lot of people are getting tired of him playing Captain Jack Sparrow over and over and over again too. Now, does he have brilliant performances in his career? Yeah, I mean, just if we, you don't have to go too far back in history. Sweeney Todd. You know, he was great in Sweeney Todd. Go back to 2004. I think it's the best performance we've had out of Johnny Depp in the past 10 years, maybe the past 15 years, is that little film he did called Finding Neverland. I thought he was brilliant in that. And here's the thing. I think the reason a lot of people... I'll speak for myself. Why somebody like me gets frustrated at Johnny Depp um, with the performances, a lot of the performances he's been giving us lately is because he has proved he can be so good. Look, when a guy sucks, you don't have any expectations out of him. You don't expect him to go in there and deliver something good. And then when they go and deliver something bad, you don't feel disappointed or let down because it's kind of what you expected. Look, when you go to see this guy's movie, you know what you're getting. I get 
angry or upset as a fan, you know, not um, obviously first world problems, folks. So we're talking, we're talking <laughs> terms of movies here. Okay. I get angry as a film fan when we go to see a film by a certain director or based on a certain uh, set of source materials or by a certain actor when we know they are capable of great stuff and then give us something less. You know, it's outside of an actor's control if a movie is a good or a bad movie. All they can do is play their role and play it the best they can, but they can give us a good performance. So I, I don't usually bang on great actors who are in ba bad movies, and I don't mm -hmm. hold actors responsible for bad movies unless they give us a subpar effort. And there have been a lot of times that Johnny Depp has given us a subpar effort, I think. And he's defaulted a lot to playing the wacky characters. That do the hands. Like Mordecai. Oh my goodness. Like I'm not looking forward to Mordecai. But we get upset because we know. It does, by getting upset at him, it's not like we're forgetting he's capable of greatness and that he has incredible talent in him. It's because he's capable of greatness and has so much talent and yet won't deliver the goods for us. That's when we get upset. It's actually a sign that we care. The sign that we actually believe. Me getting upset at Johnny Depp sometimes with some of the performances he gets is a sign that I actually believe in him yeah. and that I have high expectations because he is that damn good. But then when he gives us the tourist, I mean, you can't help but go, what the hell are you doing? So look, the track record speaks for itself. The, the last number of years, he's turned in a lot more bad films and bad performances than he has good performances and good stuff and we wouldn't be upset about it if he wasn't so good and so talented and that's what makes us all kind of perturbed at him do you think that he's maybe an actor fit for the stage like sometimes you know acting for film i feel like you have to you know there's a difference between the two mm. acting for stage acting for film so do you think he's more of a theatrical actor it's really tough to say because i've never seen him on stage yeah. i've never seen him do a theatrical work all, all i know is that there have been several occasions through his career, his illustrious career, that he has blown the house down, figuratively yeah. speaking, with his performances. <laughs> he has that talent. What's your favorite performance? I, I, th I think Finding Neverland. Okay. I, think find, I think that is a gem of a film. Which, by the way, he stars in with the same kid. I'm forgetting the kid's name. Uh, Dennis, uh, can you look up the name of the kid that stars with him in Finding Neverland and is also plays Charlie in uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Because it was that was the same. Th the funny thing about Finding Neverland is that I can't remember which came first. I think Charlie and Chocolate Factory came first. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I really liked about that movie was the dynamic between Johnny Depp and this mm -hmm. child actor in it. And then, what's the name Are of the kid? Are you talking about Freddie Highmore? Yes, Freddie Highmore, thank you. So Freddie Highmore, who's the kid actor who's now getting older, mm -hmm. um, was, was Charlie and Charlie's Shock Factory, and then he did Finding Neverland with him. And it was, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful film. I think it's Kate Winslet in Finding Neverland with them, I believe, uh, playing opposite Johnny Depp. But it's such a wonderful film filled with emotion and nuance and subtlety um, all at the same time. And, you know, there's a certain higher level that you need from an actor when he's got to play opposite children sometimes. Because mm -hmm. that's a tough thing to do sometimes. And yet somehow this very talented child actor at the time and Johnny Depp, they found a way to create this on-screen chemistry that was so good and I think gave us the best Johnny Depp we've ever had. Uh, it, he's, it was mind blowing. I love, if you have not seen it, check it out. It's called Finding Neverland. Go and watch, it's about 11 years old now. Go check it out. Well, okay. Um, <clears throat> Cunnell Kane writes, Hi AMC, I've started watching your show every day for the past year, and I would have to honestly agree with John that it is the best damn movie related show on the planet. Damn Earth. right! <laughs> My question is regarding box office failures. Why do some movies financially fail even when there are big name actors attached to it? You would assume studios expect a huge return when they invest in a big Hollywood star's name. One example <laughs> that comes to mind is Marvel invests a lot in Robert Downey Jr. because they expect his star power to translate into movie ticket transactions. However, why didn't this work out with the judge? Because they were going to see Tony Stark, they weren't going to see mm. Robert Downey Jr. We actually talked a little bit about this on yesterday's Mailbag Show, is that look, we, we there was an age in Hollywood. There was an era when it was the star yeah. who brought people out to the theater. That is no longer the case. You know, the same examples we ran down with yesterday. Chris Hemsworth in Black Hat. Chris Hemsworth's a star. 
Make no mistake about it. He's a star. He was he was wonderful um, in oh my gosh, what's that one? He the race car movie. Gosh. Rush, thank you. Um, he was magnificent in that. We're going to see him in the new Ron Howard Moby Dick mm-hmm. movie that they just pushed to Oscar season for in December. We're going to see that there. Nobody went to go see Black Hat. We mentioned Robert Downey Jr. with The Judge. We also mentioned about Christian Bale, one of the biggest stars. Just last year, he put out Out of the Furnace. Nobody went to go see that movie. Adam Sandler is a huge box office. I mean, whether what you think of his his comedy anymore is is yeah. that's a personal thing but there's no denying he's a huge box office draw men women and children made like 1.3 million dollars nobody wanted to go see it we are no longer in an era and age where people are lining up the theaters just to see a star they may line up to see a star in a certain role like they will with robert downey jr as tony stark people love that combination they'll go see him in that but outside of that Is he a big star outside of that? Well, that's a different thing. What The era we live in now is where studios are looking to get big name talent, not because that guarantees box office, because they know it doesn't anymore. It can help. Mm -hmm. It can help a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it's to give credibility to the film, right? So let's say Black Hat comes out. I guarantee you, if they got a relative no-name actor to play the lead in Black Hat, other than Chris Hemsworth, that movie wouldn't have made as much as it did. And it made very little. But it would have made even less. Because at least now when an audience member is seeing a trailer and they see a big name star in it, to them it's like, okay, this movie has some credibility to to it now. When they see Christian Bale, or they see Julia Roberts, or they see Helen Mirren, or they see you know Emma Stone, or they see, um, and now from now on, like uh, Ed Norton Jr., or they see Brad Pitt, or whatever. To them, that now locks in the audience and said, oh, this is legit. Whether that draws them out in huge numbers, that's it's a different era now. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. You uh, brought up Black Hat, and this is kind of going a little bit off topic, but when I was watching that trailer and I heard Chris Hemsworth doing an American accent, it just when when someone's a famous actor and you right. know they don't have that accent, does that bother you at all? You know, I think it's just that I've become so accustomed to it mm-hmm. that it really doesn't phase me at all. Like. Here's the thing. If Thor, if Chris Hemsworth <laughs> did not do Thor's voice in his, basically in his own accent yeah. with a little bit of a twist on it, and he just did it as a flat American accent, I think we'd be more thrown off when we hear him right. talk in interviews. That happens to me more than anything else. Like, especially with, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, went, not Wentworth. Um, who's the guy who starred in Terminator? Uh, the the, the uh, Terminator Salvation. Sam Worthington. Sam Worthington, not Wentworth. It's Wor- Worthington. You know, I hear Worthington do flat American accents mm-hmm. all the time, blah, blah, blah. And then when I go and sit down with him yeah. and start talking <laughs> with him, and he starts talking, I was like, whoa, yeah, this is like a brain readjustment. I totally forgot. This is how you talk. You talk in this freaky thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm just kidding. It is not freaky. Um, but that, I find that that throws me off more. Mm-hmm. Far more. Same thing with like a Colin... Um, Colin Farrell. Mm -hmm. Like, I hear him do straight American accents, no problem. And then I sit down and talk to him, and it's like, whoa, I totally forgot that this is what you actually sound like. It's kind of crazy. But yeah, I find it actually works the opposite for me. Probably if they do, like, a a good job at it, it doesn't really bother. bother, Exactly. If they do a good job. It doesn't even have to be a spectacular job. Just Because even people who are born in the United States Mm -hmm. or born in Canada, some people don't speak so good. (laughs) And, And it doesn't throw us off. So yeah, maybe that's the case. Alex Espinal writes, I am a huge fan of my 80s cartoons, <laughs> and I would love for a live action film based on the Thundercats. I would love it if it was made in the same fashion as the new Planet of the Apes films. Do you think this might be in the scope of possibility? It was an iconic and popular cartoon series, and I'm somewhat surprised no one has ever tackled it. Thanks and love the show. There, uh, Thundercats was a property that was in development got put on hold. Then it was in development again and then got put on the back burner mm-hmm. again. And I think the the rights have lapsed one or two times, from have gone from one company to, to another a few times. There is a particular challenge with Thundercats because Thundercats, much like He-Man and Masters of the Universe, where you can't do it on Earth. So you have to create an entire different world mm-hmm. where all this takes place. Even with Thor, mm-hmm. you know, when Marvel did the first Thor, yeah, we see Asgard, but a lot of that movie happens on Earth. It's easier to do it that way. And it appeals to more people 
when they see it happening within our world a little bit. Thundercats is a little bit different. It's tricky because you have all your characters are like these weird looking <laughs> cat hybrids, you know, Lionel, Chitara, and Panthro, and uh, you know, all these, and Tigra. They're all, please, no snarf. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> you have all these guys. But what is really interesting is somebody made, I think it was in 2012, somebody took and made a brilliant fake Thundercats trailer. And what they did, I don't know, tell me if you guys have seen this, but what they did is they took footage of Brad Pitt from that, what's that sword, uh, sword and sandal movie? Troy. Troy. They took footage of, thanks, Dennis, they took footage of uh, Brad Pitt from Troy, but they digitally did up his face and his hair and his sword to look like it was the sword of Thundera with the eye of Thundera in it, totally looking like Lino. And then they took footage of Vin Diesel from Pitch Black and grayed him out and made him look like Panthro. And then they took footage of, who did they get footage for Tigra? It was uh, Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman in clips from him playing Wolverine and put the red in the hair and made him look like Tigra. It was, it's a, as a fan put together film, it's obvious it's a fan thing. Uh It's so great. So anyway, then last year, James McAvoy from X-Men First Class, he was being interviewed and he actually said, a movie I'd love to do in his accent, which we were just talking about. And I'm not going to try to imitate his accent. He goes, but it's so cool hearing him say it in his accent. He goes, uh, one of the film I'd love to do is a, is a Thundercats movie. He, and he said, because think about it for a second. lion the leader of the Thundercats. I know I'm going into deep, deep <laughs> waters with a lot of you guys right now. But lion who is Lord of the Thundercats. You have to understand. They come from a planet that is gone now. And they escaped on a ship. And it crash lands on this other world. And they went into hibernation uh, chambers, right? But something went wrong with Linos. He was a 12-year-old boy. Something went wrong with him, and he aged as they traveled. They didn't realize. So they get out, and now he's this huge, muscular, you know, heir to be Lord of the Thundercats, right? But he's a, mentally, he's a 12-year-old boy in this body, this huge hulking beast, right? And so James McAvoy goes, think about it. This is an actor's dream, mm-hmm. To play a twelve-year-old child in the mind of this of a of a huge man, he goes that presents some great challenges, stuff like that. So anyway, so Lionel, Lord of the Thundercats, they 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 crash in the kind of the, the emblem jewel, the sword in the stone, if you will, for the Thundercats is the sword is the Eye of Thundera. You know, gives Lionel a lot of power and whatever the kind of thing he goes. And then when he needs help, he just goes thunder, 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 Thundercats, ho! Oh! And holds up the sword. It puts it puts a bat signal up for all intents and purposes up into the sky. Then all the other Thundercats know, hey, Lionel's in trouble. Let's go. Help Help him. Anyway, so <laughs> James McAvoy was actually went on and on at, at some length about how cool it would be to do a Thundercats movie. It would be hard, but I've got to believe at some point somebody's going to do it. Somebody will pull the trigger on this and do it. It's got to happen. It's got to happen. I'd love to see a Thundercats movie. Any other cartoon you'd like to see a movie for? Him? Well, a lot of them have already been done. You know, I, I for a long time I wanted to see G.I. Joe mm-hmm. and they didn't necessarily give me the G.I. Joe I wanted, but we got G.I. Joe. I wanted the Transformers forever. That that was my thing as a kid was Transformers. Mm-hmm. And the first Transformers movie did it for me. The other ones have been <laughs> sacks of crap. Um, <laughs> but uh, they pretty much have already done the ones I really want to see. The last remaining one for me, because there has been a He-Man movie, the mm-hmm. Dolph Lundgren one. Granted, we're it's time for a new one. But the last real remaining one for me is, oh, Space Battleship Yamato, also known as Star Blazers. But apparently there is a, a studio working on that. Uh, and then there's Thundercats. All right. Jorge Castillo writes, Hey, AMC crew, I love your show. Been seeing it since it began. My question is, have you ever thought of showing AMC Studios or how you prepared for AMC Movie Talk, including offices, including John's and Amy Rose's? Um, yeah, actually, Dennis and I once shot some footage. We were going to show a little bit of high... But here's the thing about AMC Movie News. It's not that exciting behind the scenes. <laughs> um, we Look, you want to see my office? I don't have one. You want to see Amy Rose's office? She doesn't have one. It's right here. Well, yeah, well, woo, we, right have, here. We, we do have studio space here at, at the AMC Burbank 16, but it's small. Um, and then we rent space at the stream.tv studios. There are great production partners over there at the stream. And we go and shoot uh, stuff there because we lease space, we shoot uh, Movie Talk and AMC Independent there. Mm-hmm. Then our stuff we shoot in here. Um, but, you know, there's not like a AMC headquarters, AMC Movie Talk headquarters. Like, 
There's just not. So how does a regular day look in the life of AMC? Um, well, with Movie Talk, I I've walked through this before, but I'll do it again just quickly. Uh, it usually starts around 5 in the morning. Uh, I get up and I start... Um, I start putting together show notes. I start researching the stories, what's going on, and then write up the show notes. Uh, because those show notes all have to be sent out to all of the cast of the show that day and our production guys by 8 o'clock. That's got to be sent out. Because then from there, guys like Ray have to start assembling all the graphics. They they can't assemble the graphics until so they see what the show notes are. So they have to start assembling the graphics because those graphics have all got to be done by 10.30 because mm -hmm. the show goes live at 11. So those show notes have to be put out there by 8 o'clock. Uh, and then guys like Dennis start taking and doing the, the production stuff. Uh, if Dennis is on the show that day and Schnepp's on the show that day, they start looking through the show notes, start formulating what they want to do. We usually show up to the studio around 10.30, 10.45. We get mic'd up, we get lit, uh, and then we shoot the show at 11.00. Uh, from there, like I, you know, then I will go home. I will do some follow-up stuff that needs to be done on the show about, you know, where it's got to be put and all that kind of stuff for, for marketing sake and stuff like that. Then I'll usually start working on another show I have to do that week, whether it's mailbag or whether it, it's something else that we're doing. I then try to generally do meetings, uh, budgeting, uh, reports, research, all that kind of stuff during the days as well. And then in the evenings, if there's events we have to do, whether it's like meetings or whether it's screens, uh, screeners, or whether it's you know any other types of things like that. Uh, and then, so after the show is shot, then uh, Ray or Jonathan or whatever, depending on what the show is, they will take that show. If it's movie talk, they will chop up movie talk in its individual segments, get all the individual posts put up on uh, Facebook. It's, it's a lot of administrative and creative work mm -hmm. behind the scenes. But uh, yeah, we don't even have our own offices. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it may look all glamorous, <laughs> but, it, but believe me, it is not. I, when I first started with you guys, I remember, I just think it's so crazy we, that we literally get the show notes that morning. I remember yes. like saying, okay, John, are you going to send me the show notes the night before? And you're like, no, 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 no. The notes come <laughs> yep. the morning of. It's funny because I'll get people... You know, when we would have a guest on the show, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, pull a name out of the hat. Uh, who's one of our, whether it's Jamie Philbrick or something, mm -hmm. it's going to be. And the first time they'll come and be a guest on the show, if they're guesting on Wednesday, so do you think maybe Monday you can let me know what the topics are going to yeah. be? It's like, no. Yeah. We don't know what the topics are going to be until the morning of the show. Because we can put the show, let's say for Tuesday, right? We can put the show notes, uh, we can start getting ready for Tuesday's show, that's fine. But on Monday at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, there's a lot of movie news stories that are yeah. going to drop between 5 o'clock Monday afternoon and 8 a.m. the next day. And even then, when we send out show notes at 8 a.m. the day of the show, quite often we still have new news that yeah. drops that between when we get the show notes done and the show. So we can't responsibly, we can't, because if I put the show notes together uh, on Monday night, or Monday night, right, then... Ray is going to start putting together the graphics that maybe two big more right. stories or three big more stories drop and it completely just scraps all the hard work that Ray then had to put in in putting these graphics together. That's gone. So we can't put out the show notes till the next morning. So yeah, it's, it's tight and mm -hmm. we do it every single day. It's funny how many people I know who do weekly shows Yeah, and they'll talk to us and they go, how do you do this <laughs> every day? It's the gig. Yeah. We love it. We love doing what we do. The glamorous life. <laughs> Ricky Moloch writes, Hi, everyone. With his collaborations with Jared Leto and Ben Affleck, is there a possibility that David Fincher may be the one to take on the upcoming solo Batman film? Money says Ben Affleck will direct himself in the Batman. Because you didn't get Ben Affleck just to be the actor. Mm -hmm. You got him because he's one of the best directors in Hollywood mm -hmm. right now. But, excellent theory in there uh, about you know David Fincher he is, he's worked with Jared Leto he has worked with Ben Affleck before uh, with great success obviously like with uh, with Gone Girl so that was very recent the fact that the superhero genre continues to attract bigger and bigger acting talent and directing talent it's just a matter of time be before we see a, a, a Fincher it's just a matter of time before we see a Spielberg it's just a matter of time before we see a Scorsese dare I say direct a comic book film this would be a great fit because like you mentioned Fincher is not only a magnificent director but his directing style would be really good for a Dark Knight kind mm -hmm. of film it'd be really great for a Batman film and he's worked with Leto and he's worked with Brad I was gonna say Brad Pitt um, mm -hmm. uh, and he's worked with Ben Affleck but I still believe the smart money says that Ben Affleck will direct his own Batman film 
Um, we have nothing to back that up with that, said, that guarantees that. Not at all. It could very well be somebody else. It could totally be somebody else. But I think if you had to put money on it, you put money on the fact that Ben Affleck would direct it himself. I've been seeing some rumors or some articles, rumor articles, that um, say that um, Batman could make a cam- cameo in Suicide Squad to lead up to his solo film to kind of give him an introduction. Do you think that's going to happen? Um, well, that's just pure speculation. Mm-hmm. But... But it's speculation that makes sense. It still doesn't change that it's just speculation. But it would be speculation that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, To put him in... Because look, if you're going to have the Joker in there, if you're creating this cinematic universe, you have to build it on the shoulders of your heavy hitters. Well, who and what are your heavy hitters? Batman and Superman. So that doesn't mean that Batman has to play a significant role in the Suicide Squad. Not at all. But have him pop up. To have to start to connect the dots and connect yeah. these films in the cinematic universe, it would totally make sense. I won't be surprised if they do it all. I put no stock in these reports, mm-hmm. these reports. I put no stock in them at all, but it very well could work out that way and it would totally make That'd sense. That'd be cool to see him with the Joker. Oh, yes. Yeah. The new Batman with the new Joker. Yeah. I, Man, we talked about this before, <laughs> but I almost feel like the whole success, that might be hyperbole a little bit, but follow me here. I almost feel like the whole success of this whole new DC Cinematic Universe is going to hinge on whether Jared Leto works as the uh, Joker. Yeah. Because, look, Gal Gadot comes out as Wonder Woman. People don't like her. Whatever. We didn't really expect much mm-hmm. from her. Uh, you know, the dude who's playing Cyborg comes out. Whatever. Cyborg's not a big major character. Not a lot of emotional investment. Okay, he works. Okay, he doesn't work. Whatever. People, <laughs> there's a huge expectation and huge shoes to fill with Jared Leto. And he's the guy to do it. He is the guy to do it. But there's huge expectation on what he brings us as the Joker. And if the Joker don't work, I think it's going to hurt oh, yeah. the DC Cinematic Universe a lot. But if he works as the Joker and gives us a Joker we all love, boom, boom. That gives a lot of momentum to the DC Cinematic Universe and leads well yeah. into it. So a lot is going to rest on that movie. he got the weight of the world on his weight shoulders. Weight of the whole Cinematic Universe on his shoulders. We'll see how he plays out. All right, guys, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for joining us again. And you can head over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your Showtime theaters and ticket information. And if you want a podcast version of this episode, check out the description box below and click that subscribe button. Thanks to the guys in the room, Dennis and Jonathan. And thanks to you, John. John, where can people find you online? You can find me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter at John Campia. You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley Movin. Thanks again so much for joining us, guys, and we'll see you next time.